Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Rami Eid, and I am exploration geologist at Rashbetko. Rashbetko is a GB company with Shell, which operates in ultra deep water in the Mediterranean. Uh, today, we are presenting seismic methods in oil and gas exploration. This talk will be presented by Dr. Ali Bak. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. I will bring them up during the presentation and we will also have a time for questions at the end. Now we will turn the time over to Dr. Adipak. Our presenter today is expert in oil and gas sector with more than 40 years of experience in exploration and development, geophysics and geology at all Egyptian provinces. He worked in Gulf of Suez, Western Desert, Nile Delta, Eastern Desert, and Sinai. And he worked also outside Egypt, like Sudan, Syria, Yemen, Oman, Chile, Norway, and the Kuwait. Dr. Ali worked, worked for different scale companies, like Shell, Philips, Apache, uh, Phoenix, Webco, Khalda, Arun, and Ibrox. Also, he taught for 20 years at Alexandria, Cairo, and the Enchants, British University in Cairo, and American University in Cairo. Dr. Ali got his PhD in exploration seismology from Cairo uh, District University at 1995. Thanks, Dr. Ali, for accepting our invitation. And now it is your time to start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thanks, Rami. Uh, I'm very uh, pleasant and uh, happy actually to join you and uh, give you an overview uh, for the seismic interpretation. Uh, actually, this is a part of uh, three levels, uh, uh, of course, and uh, this is just a level one. I thought it would be better to start with level one and see how uh, it will go. Once you are satisfied, I promise that I can continue with level two and level three, inshallah, in the near future. Uh, for, uh, to start directly, because we are very limited on time, uh, uh, I should give you an idea about the seismic itself, some of the limitation of the seismic, the meaning of the seismic, and then how we are acquiring our 2D data versus 3D data as a principle. Then we will jump to a little bit some introduction about what we are looking for, why you need, especially if you are a reservoir engineer or an engineer, why you need to learn more about uh, seismic exploration, uh, how does affect this on your career, how you can cooperate uh, together with the GNG, the link between reservoir engineers and the uh, geophysicists and geologists, very important as integrated work together. And this is the lesson actually during the 40 years that I kept from time to time to repeat it uh, for my colleagues. Let us go ahead and see what's, what is the meaning of limitation of seismic and then also how we are acquiring on our 2D data. In the front of you, this is a cross section. This is a, a map view on a seismic line as a line, as you can see it. And the element or the G-phones that listen to the sound are recorded by this little uh, uh, dots in here. Actually, all of this, all of them are blunted, but only part of them are alive. So if I go to the cross section, if you have the line and the cross section like that, and in the middle of the line, you have the firing point, the point is that we are producing energy from it, sound energy from it. And then the sound energy goes to the subsurface, to a reflector. The, two, the reflector represents two beds. Bed up from the reflector and the bed below the reflector. And those two beds uh, does have a difference on the velocity and density. We call it a cross the impedance. And then accordingly, the sound goes from the surface to the inter, uh, the inter uh, bed in, in between here. And then it reflects back and recorded with the, uh, uh, recorded with the, uh, the, the, the G-folds. This means that on case of this means that in case of 2D, you have line laid out on the map view and the cross section on the subsurface. In case also, and the, the short point usually lies on the same trend with the, uh, the, with the uh, receivers. 
So the, the, the source and receivers are planted or are uh, put it on the same cross section. So this is the Z and this is the X or Y. So it's a 2D, it's a kind of 2D. That's why you call it a 2D. Actually, you are acquiring from different points on the subsurface to different point on the surface. And each point on the subsurface can cover more than once. What does it mean? It means that the sound goes to that point multiple times. And you call that a common depth point. Why we are doing that? Actually, we are doing that to enhance the data and the, uh, increase the signal to, no, to noise ratio. Uh, on the on contrary, in the case of the 3D, actually the G phones are not planted online, but they are planted on a kind of uh, uh, area. So it's an area rather than line. And the shooting, which is the red flag in this case, is more or less perpendicular to it. So this could be perpendicular to this group, and this also could be per perpendicular to that group. So what does it mean? It means that one conclusion, in case of 2D, the source and receiver are on the same X, Z uh, direction, the same cross section. Uh, while in case of the 3D, the, 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 uh, the traces or the G phones are planted in aerial and the shooting is perpendicular to them. We have to understand this. Uh, as this simple principle, because on the interpretation, we are going to use this very much. Yes? Now, a, a question, can the seismic see everything on the subsurface? Can we see uh, 10 meters on the subsurface? Can we see five meters? Can we see five centimeters? The answer is no. Actually, the seismic is limited. It's limited to resolve as a, a, a special thickness of the bed, and is limited to resolve an extension of the bed. So if the bed, as example, is half kilometer uh, or 10 by 10 meter, as example, uh, less than that, 10 by 10 meter, you will never be able to see it uh, at depths uh, 3,000 meter. Uh, While well, you can see it at depths 1,000 meter. So there is, a, we call that the horizontal resolution. So the horizontal resolution is, can we see two features beside each other? Can we resolve those two features? Can we see the extension of the bed? If the bed is not extended, you cannot see it. If the bed extended, you could see it. So this is what we call it seismic limitation. Also, the thickness of the bed. The thickness of the bed, if the, the bed is very thin, sometimes you cannot see it. There is some mathematical relations that will tell you how far you can see on the subsurface. In the front view, this is a, a seismic cross-section, 2D seismic. And I wanted to see if I can see some data at uh, 1600. You know that everything on the subsurface for the geophysicist is in time. So 1600 millisecond means 1.6 second. Can I see a bit uh, at, at that level, at that depth? Uh, how far? How can I see it? Actually, with very simple calculation, we can tell you that, as example, the bed here can you only can see the bed that thicker than 40 meter, as example, or 30 meter, as example. Once your bed is less than 30 meters, you will never be able to track it laterally within the seismic. And this is a kind of limitation. Also, if this bed extended or not extended, also it's another limitation, we call it a Fresnel zone. In the front view, this is the surface and this is the ignition point, not the point that we produce a, a, a seismic waves from it. Once we did so, your seismic will travel and then it will hit the subsurface in, in here. The area that the wave front hit the subsurface is called the Z-Fresnel zone. So this is the minimum area extension of a bed that can be resolved. If your area of the bed is less than that area, you cannot see it. And this is what we call it Fresnel zone. So again, conclusion that our seismic is not a magic. It cannot see every thickness of bed. It cannot see every extension of the bed. It needs a minimum thickness of the bed to be seen, and it, it, it needs a minimum extension of the bed to be seen. Now we learned it what? We learned the difference between 2D and 3D very roughly. One of them, which is a 2D, uh, the, the shot and the receiver are on the same plane, uh, while in the 3D, the, the receivers are on, are on uh, uh, an aerial plane, uh, while the, uh, the shooting is perpendicular to them. 
and also we learn it together that the seismic is not a magic and there is the difference in the vertical and horizontal resolution that limits our seeing to the seismic yes now let's jump to uh, some of the structure uh, uh, principles that you need to learn why we are shooting seismic what is the principle that, uh, that we need it in order to shoot seismic as example we are shooting seismic to image the, the subsurface. What kind of image you need? You need to see the folds. You need to see the folds. Both of them, you need to see them. Actually, the, the, the folds are simpler to be seen because they're extension and there is no complex on them. While in case of the folds, usually our hard job is the fault geometry itself. I'm going to ask you, how do you imagine the shape of the surface of the fault? Because unless you are familiar with the shape of the surface of the fault, you are not be able to see that fault on the subsurface at the seismic. So I'm, go I'm going to jump to something very interesting to you. And in the front view, usually the fault plane in the textbook, the fault is, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is imaged like what? Like a page from a notebook, which completely is not right. It's not right to see it like that. Look at, the, at, uh, at that definition. This is a fault blade. So this is an upstream side. This is downstream side. And this is your fault blade. Yeah? It's like a square or something like that, which actually, impractically, it's not so. The symbol shape of the fault can be imaged due after the 3D interpretation into a kind of ellipse, like in the, in the front of you. So my faults will be on the 3D vision like a kind of uh, uh, ellipse. Why it's ellipse and it's not a kind of square? Actually, very simple, because on the surface, the fault got what we call it, if you walk on the field, on the mountain, and you look at the fault, you will see that the fault got what we call it, taper off and taper on. It's ended from both sides. So unless it's like this shape, it will never be ended. So that's why, we are saying that the fault itself is not a kind like a page from a notebook or like a, a, a square. It's a kind of ellipse. And this ellipse is not very smooth, but it has some irregularities. I used to tell my student that the best description for a fault plane is a piece, a slice of chipsy. Potatoes chipsy, a slice of potatoes chipsy. It's like ellipse. And it's not smooth, it's not straight, but it's had some irregularity in them. This is a typical description for the fault. Some of the items about the faults that you need to be aware, other than that, you will never be able to interpret this fault on the seismic. Number one is the fault plane. So now we already defined the fault plane. We call that the fault mapping parameter. You would like to map the fault, then you need to, you know, to learn this parameter. And number two, the fault heave. As example, if I image this fault, on the plane, on the map plane, then this is the upstream side of my fault, and this is the stripe of my fault. So this is the bit tagged on blue, and it is when it hit by the fault, it has what we call it the fault stick strike, the fault strike. So this is the fault strike. You have a fault strike comes from the upstream side to the fault plane, and you have a fault strike come to the downstream side with the fault plane. The, those can be imaged vertically on the map and we call it by the fault uh, uh, polygon. So this is the faulty polygon that comes from the strike of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, upstream side and the strike of the downstream side. If you imagine that there's many beds coming on the upstream side and many beds coming on the downstream side, each one of them got a strike with the fault. If we connected those strikes of the fault with the different beds, it will bring you the fault plane. Another thing, if I cut this with seismic line in this case, actually, which is this part in this case, if I just move this down, which will tell you this part, the edge of that ellipse, it's called the fault stick. Actually, the, the simple description for the fault stick when you have a seismic section and you got your pencil and you start to trace the, the, the place of the fault by your pencil. What you are drawing here is the fault stick. You learn the fault plane, you learn the default uh, uh, strike, and then you learn the fault stick and the fault polygon. Now you got the fault heave and the fault thrown. The fault heave actually at the distance 
horizontally for the case of normal fault between the strike of the upstream side and the strike of the downstream side, and it represented the area where the bed is not presented or partially presented. It depends on the throne of the fault. If this area is representing the area where is the bed is faulted out, completely faulted out, it's not there, or it's partially represented there. And actually, the fault depth, which is the degree of depth of the fault, which is very important, keep in mind this, the amount of this depth, because it's different in case of normal fault, reverse fault, strike slip fault. Each one of those faults simply got a range of depth. So if the dip, as example, reaches 80 degrees or 85 degrees or 90 degrees, this means that it's a kind of strike slip fall. If the, the dip is 60 degree or 30 degree, this means that you got uh, normal fault and reverse fault. Yes? So the, 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 dip, the dip angle itself is very important. The azimuth, which is the direction of the dip, the, so it's 30 degree in the north, 30 degree in the northeast, in the northwest, this is the azimuth. So you've got dip direction, You've got deep amount, you've got fault strike, fault stick, fault polygon, fault heave, fault plane, and the fault throne. Or thrones mean the, uh, uh, the, the, the vertical separation. How much the upstream side and downstream side have been separated from each other, this is what we call it the fault throne. All those together are, we call them the fault mapping parameter. For anyone who are working on the oil business, geologist, geophysicist, Reservoir engineer, he has to understand this concept, simple concept, very simply. On the, on, the, on the field in the front of you, as example, if you have one fault like the red one, and then another fault like the blue, the blue one. Actually, when you see this on the map, you should look at the, uh, the connection of the fault. If you connected those two faults in, more, in, the, in, in the extension basin, you, you should have the, 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 the submission of those two faults should be equal to that fault to completely in order to be connected. I'll tell you what also, there is a relation between the length of the fault in the field and the amount of the throne. So you'll never be able to, to, see, to put as example, fault only extended for one kilometer uh, while its throne is three, is three kilometer. It will never happen in the nature. It's very important to realize exactly what you are seeing of data before going to the next step of the interpretation. And there are a rule of thumb here, the length to the maximum thrown, L over T varies from 20 to 150. So the length of the fault should be 20 times, at least 20 times value more than the, uh, uh, if, if the thrown is one, the length of the fault should be 20 or maybe more. As you saw, it should be 20 or more. Uh, actually, 60 is a good ap approximation. So it's between actually 20 and 150 is almost 60. So the length over the throne should be about 60 approximation. You have to look for your uh, uh, seismic interpretation to see this approximation very important. And also in case of strike slip fault uh, or even the sedimentary the rocks, since positional fault, sometimes the L over T ratio increase more than that. Well, I'm, I'm going to jump directly to the kind of fault. So this this such a kind of fault where you have a parallel, more or less parallel fault. We call them a, a, a kind of domino shape for the fault uh, flow, the blo uh, blocks. And actually, usually you see this as a kind of books on the library. When you look for the library shelf, it's it kind of blocks. And all of them are uh, 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 more or less flexured on the same direction. And they got two scales. They got small scales and large scale. So an example here, very big scale for those faults and very small scales in that, uh, in that case. So the first uh, uh, type of faults is uh, uh, blanners, uh, a kind of uh, blanners. We call them blanners. We will see this on the seismic. Then the, uh, uh, this is on the seismic. On the seismic, you got very, as example, in the front, very nice blanners in there. This styles is very important for the interpreter. When you look at the seismic, we directly know what kind of trap when we look at the, uh, the, the type of the style. We look at the style in order to, to, to predict the type of trap. So in this case, those blender will bring you a different compartment. Each compartment, uh, like example, each compartment will have its own oil water contact, will have its own ceiling in this case. Let us go next. This is the interpretation of this uh, kind of uh, blender, uh, fault styles. 
and then we will jump to this is on the cross section view on the seismic the shape on the map will be like this three way deep closure from blender fault so in the cross section it was it was normal fault uh, it was normal fault uh, on the previous example let me go back to it so it was normal fault more or less blender and then we actually when we go on the map view you will see you will see the closures uh, are more or less three way deep closures and each of these three deep closure will have its own oil water contact and it will have its own ceiling and usually such kind of blender entrapment on the seismic usually doesn't have a one big uh, field but have different small fields beside each other each one of these nice trap could have say 10 15 20 well on from them actually many uh, feet in the western desert of egypt are like this in libya it's just like this in uh, in sudan it's just like this all the uh, north africa have this kind of the uh, blanner's uh, shape of uh, uh, of fault uh, jump to the next one which is the uh, uh, listric fault the listric fault the shape of the fault on the cross section usually like crescent and actually on the map view it's like crescent as well so you see as example in the front of you here on the on on the field you'll see that the fault have some sort of uh, uh, curve on, on the shape on the cross section and thicknesses on the downstream sides are thicker than the upstream sides and also the scale this is a big scale uh, while it could be very small scale like in here you look at that bin so uh, so even for the style of the uh, uh, electric fault you do have big scale and small scale and the most important things in here is the shape of the fault itself on the cross section it will be crescent shape and on the map view like what we're going to see it's right. going to be Guys, let me back uh, back to this. Uh, I'm not sure if you, uh, because actually I just found by mistake uh, a drawback of the Arabic sound over there. Uh, let me show you the, uh, on the cross section, you have the shape of the crescent of the fault itself. And on the downstream side, you have the rollover anticline representing the best trap in case of the electric fault. On the seismic, you can see the, uh, uh, the uh, anticline and also the rollover anticline usually uh, have an axe. This axe is barrel to the fault that produce. To the left, there is also an, a shape of the crescent fault from the seismic, and then you have the rollover anticline. Those are the two, uh, uh, the two uh, shape of uh, uh, structure style that you can see it on the seismic. Another shape of, from the seismic, C the shape of the fault itself, it looks like crescent in, in, in here. And also you have some sort of rollover anticline. This is also representing the type of the structure style of the uh, uh, rollover anticline that associated with the electric fault. Um, here the interpretation, you can see the fault and you can see the anticline on the down thrown side. Uh, by uh, uh, revealing that, we'll jump directly. So uh, let, let me resume first what we talked about. We talked about the blender fault and how the traps of the blender faults could be look like on the seismic. And then we talked about listric and how the shape of the listric on the cross section like crescent and on the map view like crescent and how it produce a rollover anticline on the downstream side where you can have an axe parallel fault itself. And it represents a very uh, a nice target trap uh, for the exploration. Now we will jump to the reverse fault. Uh, in the front view, there is a seismic section. 
there is a seismic section on the front of you, as you can see, and it has been affected by reverse fault and the reverse fault's position in here. And actually, we have to take in consideration the dip angle of the reverse fault itself. Uh, see, this is the dip angle of the reverse, the reverse fault, and those are blank uh, colored in uh, yellow are the correlatable unit. So this unit is that unit just for I to follow. And you can see the, uh, the place of the fault uh, uh, in between. And this, of course, comes by the compression rather than extension. The first two styles that we talked about uh, comes from uh, extension regime. And now we are talking about compression regime. The area is uh, uh, affected by compression uh, regime. And it produced the, uh, uh, this nice uh, anticline. And this is our colored model for the previous uh, uh, for the previous interpretation, where you have if you drilled a well here, you will see this uh, you will see this uh, uh, you will see this bit repeated more than once, and this bit could be repeated more than once, and this bit could be more repeated more than once. This give you a sense of the reverse. The uh, reverse happen, and then some erosion will happen. Another example from the Gulf of, Me of Mexico showing the very nice uh, uh, a kind of reverse fault very, with very nice uh, interference uh, and different kind of faults as, uh, as well. Uh, jumping from the uh, tension regime by uh, planners and by uh, 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 gross faults or uh, listric faults to the reverse faults, and now we're going to talk a little bit about the strike slip fault. Strike slip fault, the angle of the fault itself or the dip of the fault usually between 75 or 80 up to 90. So it could be vertical more or less. And usually it's basement involved. The basement itself involved on the movement itself. And a very important example with this the Dead Sea example between uh, uh, Sinai and the Arabian Plateau itself around Lebanon, Syria, uh, and going to even to uh, Aqaba uh, in Egypt. Uh, it could be uh, in the direction of the watch or uh, uh, right lateral or left lateral. So those are the two components. One of them uh, re uh, moved relative to the other one in that direction. We call it Dexter or right lateral or even its left lateral. The end result of that is uh, uh, a nice change on the shape of the, uh, uh, the uh, traps itself. On the map view, you can see this very easily on, uh, on the right, left, right lateral and left lateral. And actually on the cross section, you can see it either uh, to uh, producing what we call a positive flower structure or a negative flower structure on the section where one of the uh, units moved toward you like T and the other one moved away from you uh, in, the, in the other direction. And it reduced very complicated kind of uh, 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 structural uh, trap. Now the question, why we are getting all of this complication? Actually, the structure geology, how you will, you will never be able to interpret seismic data without having uh, uh, this structure geology in, uh, on your mind uh, while you interpreting your, uh, uh, your data. Um, the last style, but the most important one, is the inverted basin structure. Some of the area geologically all over the world subjected to tension in their geological history. And then after that compression or transpression uh, on a later period. The, the change from uh, uh, tension regime into uh, transpression regime or compression regime changed the shape of the uh, totally the shape of the subsurface. Uh, what was used to be in low relief start to be high and vice versa, the high relatively become low. Actually, we can from seismic recognize this directly. And I'm gonna show you some uh, interesting uh, criteria that I collected myself and put them on seventh point, uh, as you can see here, seventh point that if you look at those, if you uh, uh, recorded those seventh point from the seismic, this will tell you that your area subjected to tension and then compression or transpression. And you have to make sure that you understand this in order to pick up your right uh, track. From the seismic, very interesting stuff on the seismic. Uh, this is across all of these features are cross uh, features from uh, real seismic data. I'll start with the first one. If you have a fault 
at the cross section that showing normal thrown at depth and reverse for a thrown up as example in here look at that fault look at that fault this fault is showing the red one this fault is showing let me change my pointer so you can see it uh, like laser uh, look at the, the red fault in here. You can see that the throne of the fault is normal and the thrown up is reverse. Very interesting. This fault is, is completely normal. This fault is completely normal. This fault is showing normal down and reverse up. When you see something like that, count that as one of the seven criteria that will tell you this area subjected to an inversion. Look for different other, uh, other stuff. Look at the, that fault. This fault to the left, you have null. You have no, no any other displacement. A while when you go up, you will see the displacement on the other reflector is reversed. And here it's showing a kind of asymmetric anticline. The shape also are a criteria for inversion where you have an, a, a null point of displacement and reverse point, and then you got a, 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 a asymmetric anticline in, in four. Uh, in the up. Look at the third example, this example from Tunisia actually. Uh, you, the, you see that the fault is showing reverse and very nice anticline, uh, asymmetric anticline in the top of it. When you look at this example from Egypt, again, the fault is showing reverse thrown and showing here a very nice asymmetric anticline in there. On the map view, this nice anticline could be something like that, a very nice uh, trending north east south west anticline from the same area and actually the fault is heading after this nice uh, uh, asymmetric anticline and usually there is dip fast dip in that direction and gentle dip in the other direction so it is a kind of asymmetric anticline so i counted now at least five or six criteria that you can pick it up from the seismic and you can tell yourself that this area is subjected to extension and then compression or transpression and what expectation you have for the track. Directly when you see this kind of inversion, your expectation will go to, the, to this, directly to this nice uh, targeted traps, asymmetric one in here, in there, in there, in here, in there, everywhere. So as example, here, let us check our uh, understanding for the inversion, for the structure inversion from the seismic data. So you will see nice asymmetric anticline, short, steep limb, and then gentle back other uh, limb. One criteria. The other, reverse fault in here and the anticline in there. Two. Number three, fault that thrown normal here and reverse here. Let me put the interpretation. And then fault throwing normal here and reverse for oh, up. Fault uh, throwing reverse here. And actually, if you look for all the other fault, which are kind of planners, yes, there is no any indication about inversion. So this is what we call it differential inversion. So not all of the faults subjected to the same uh, uh, to the same compression air regime or tension affected directly. It could be affected, but we cannot pick it from the seismic. Something interested in here, look at this feature. Here is up, down, up, which means that this is grappling. And then when you go here, down, up, down, horse. So horse above trapping, grappling will tell you that this area is subjected to inversion. Something very interesting also. And last point for the inversion prediction. When you think the thickness of the blue for the recent deposit after this green color, the recent deposit are thickening on that direction. Now, while we are talking and discussing, the deposition is happening in that area. Last in the past, the deposition thickening was here on the green. So the depositional center, it changed from here on the past during the green into now the blue. So the change of the positional center will tell you that this area area subjected to extension and then into compression. Now I'm going to jump a little bit about the faults and start with this introduction, start a little bit to teach you something, how we are doing our real job on the interpretation. 
Now, the guys who are not aware with the acquisition have some idea about the acquisition, the 2D versus, versus the 3D. The guys who doesn't have uh, an idea about the structure style, aware with the structure style about the extension regime or the uh, uh, compression regime or the transpression or transtension uh, regimes and aware with the structure that will happen. If it's planar, if it is a gross fault or electric fault, or if it is a strike slip fault, or even if it is uh, inverted. And from the seismic, anyone out the geologist and geophysicist can infer for the reservoir engineer, the structure style and its complication. And accordingly, the uncertainties that will come from the data that have been interpreted. The reservoir engineer need to understand that the geologist and the geophysicist got some limitation, limitation and uncertainties. The limitations come from the seismic, the limitations comes from the tool. And then the uncertainties come from the tools and also come from the interpretation itself. So if you put a fault, you sometimes you don't, uh, you are not sure that this is the, the right position of the faults, it can be changed from error. And the reservoir engineer should understand this. Now, let us see how we can start our interpretation. Well, we got this background that we got it in, in the last 20, uh, 35 minutes or, or more. The first thing to do is to tie your well data on the depth domain with your seismic data on the uh, uh, time domain. Because you have two domains, all the seismic is in time, uh, while all the well data, the drilling of the well data is on uh, depth. We tie that with what we call it uh, seismic to well tie. The seismic to well tie, I need to, defi to define my well tops that I got it from my well that I drilled, the depths per each uh, 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 top, um, including my reservoir, into my seismic. Uh, while my seismic is on time and the well is in depth. I use to tie this, I use what? I use what we call it seismic to will tie. Can be done by many uh, different tools. The, the main tool to tie them is what we call it synthetic seismograms, where we use the uh, velocity and density and velocity log, the, velo the, the sonic log, the density log, and the check shot or velocity log together to come up with a 1D, a trace like the, the seismic trace representing the well. And this trace, the synthetic seismogram, got two scales. One of those scales is time scale that fit the seismic, and the other is depth scale that fit the well logs. So I can switch between the time scale and the depth scale on that synthetic seismogram. The way of creating seism a synthetic seismogram is not our issue here. I, I don't want to uh, go to the details of drone, but just understand the idea that I can transfer the uh, uh, well tops from my well logs into my seismic from the depth domain into my seismic on the time domain using the synthetic seismogram, or sometimes we do what we call it vertical seismic profile, where we are recording inside the wells the velocity of the waves per each bed the velocity of the wave per each bit that I have been drilling. Yes, and from that also I can give a time depth table that can transfer the data from time to depth by using the informations from velocity. If I did so, I will be able to mark my beds, my tops, my reservoir, my source rock, my cap rock directly on the on the seismic. I can put them word on the side. And in the front of you in here, this is my uh, 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 my seismic. I can get this my data directly to my seismic on that location using the synthetic seismogram and start to mark my uh, horizon. Uh, the creation of the synthetic seismogram is very simple using the as I mentioned the density log the velocity log, and then multiply the velocity by density, come up with acoustic impedance, and then uh, calculate the reflectivity using uh, the uh, RC equal to uh, uh, rho 2 V2 minus rho 1 V1 uh, divided by rho 2 V2 plus rho 1 V1, the, ref the reflection coefficient uh, uh, equation, very simple, and then come up with one trace, and this trace got two scales. One scale is on time, 
other scale is on dips, and I can use this synthetic seismogram to tie the well data with the seismic data. Yes? Now, if I tied my seismic data, I already tied my seismic data, and I'm quite happy with what I got. What is the next? Do I, um, I go directly and map my horizons and map my fault? The answer is no. Now, the technology learned us to use what we call it automated structural interpretation. Actually, it's not automatic. It's an automated, the automated, the, the word automated means that I'm gonna use my software to help me in order to enter my structure element. Not to interpret the data, but to help me to interpret the data. That's why we call it automated. None of, of the people now all over the world is using the, the, the manual, the normal manual uh, uh, line by line. But we are using the volume attribute, the structure at the volume attribute, where we can calculate some of the attributes for the volume directly without doing any kind of interpretation. We can uh, uh, calculate some of those attributes that would help me to define the strike of my main faults and my minor faults. Even now, with the quality of the data, I would be able to define not only the uh, faults, but all of the fractures. The fracture in the carbonate rock, as example, is responsible for the porosity. So I can use this volume attribute just by click. You put the seismic volume from one side, and you get from the other side the volume as an I attribute. I'm going to show you this in a minute. In the front of you, very interesting two features. Yes? Uh, this is a time slice. I'm not sure if you are aware with the 3D displays. The 3D displays, the, the, the 3D uh, seismic come from like a cube of data. And this cube of data, you can slice this data in any direction you like. You can slice it vertically and we call it inline, like seismic section in here. Or another line perpendicular to that one, we call it inline. So there is inline, cross line perpendicular to each other, and they are, they are seismic, uh, 2D seismic section, like 2D seismic section. We call it core inline and, co uh, uh, and cross line. And also we can have a time slice where I have more or less iso time through the, uh, through the volume itself. So in the front of you, this is a map view for a horizon picked using 3D seismic. And to the left, this is an inline or cross line. It's, it's almost the, the same. If you would like to see the shape of this inline or cross line on the map, you can see it. So in, in that direction, this is inline. In the other direction, this is cross line or whatever. You can switch vice versa, call that inline and cross line or cross line and inline. And then the, uh, the time slice. Actually, the data displays on the time slice in here, it's not the direct seismic data but a kind of attribute. I use this data and use my computer and I asked my software to change, to calculate the seismic attribute here called variance or actually coherency. And this attribute is a kind of calculation. It does have a mathematical meaning, uh, which uh, a correlation between each single trace and it will give me another volume of seismic called variance cube. At that variance cube, I can cut time slice, like this time slice or depth slice, if the data is the depth domain. And actually from this slice at the level of interest, I can slice at any level, from zero level up to the end of the data. And I, at this time slice, I can look for the strike of my fault. Look at this nice strikes of the faults, very resolvable. When I go do my mapping, I have to follow this. To follow this fault. So this a trend of faults have been done by the variance. I didn't do any interpretation. I just got my data and calculated the variance. And from the variance, I looked at my faults, at the strike of my faults at that level. And actually, there is another direction. You can see the north is the big fault. This is a big fault, another big fault a third big fall, and they cut it by another northwest southeast fall. All of that resolve it directly. When I do my mapping, I should follow this strikes of that fall. This means that I'm doing my interpretation on a real 3D vision. I will never divide my interpretation into inlines 
and the cross line and the connect them blindly on the map. No, I put my variance uh, uh, attribute or other any other attribute with my inline, with my cross line, and then I start fault by fault on the real 3D vision, on the real 3D vision. Look at that. I'm gonna show you this example, how we do that. This is seismic section. This is variance or coherency volume. And actually I go back and forth with that inline in that direction or that direction. And at each one of those in line or cross line, I put the position of my fault and the move and the position. So the net result will put my strikes. So this is my strikes for the fault. And this is my stick. Sorry, this is my stick for the fault. And this is my strike for the fault. So my sticks that comes from the inline or cross line or my strike that comes from the uh, variance or coherency together are connected and they are forming what? They are forming my fault plane. They are forming my fault. Very, very, very uh, 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 informative together and very accurate as well. So I never did do my interpretation on the basic of inline, cross line and the map view. This is wrong. We have to use the three direction vision uh, while doing interpretation to exactly check the uh, uh, the fault plane. Uh, then actually, when you, uh, things got crowded, so you have the uh, blue fault, uh, you have the green fault, you have the yellow fault, different fault, each one will have identification. Then after that, we are going to change those, this fault, fault by fault into plane, fault to plane. Now I have fault to plane. Before I have fault sticks, connected them together and they come up with faulty plane. Now I have my faulty plane, resolve it on a 3D vision. Yes, and you can see the fault top and the fault grid itself, very smooth and very important. And you can see that the shape of the fault, is not like a page from the notebook or it's not like a square or any other uh, geometrical shape. It looks like uh, uh, ellipse and maybe irregular ellipse as well. Once I finished my, uh, uh, my interpretation and I changed my faults into the fault plane, um, I will start to uh, uh, do my horizon interpretation, horizon by horizon, and then I can come with a, a map like in the front of you. And as, I, as you can see, this map has been interpreted each line. So not each five lines or in each cross line, no, each in line and each cross line together, line by line. But actually we are not putting by line, but we are going segment by segment. I finish this segment and use my auto uh, automated interpretation uh, uh, tools in order to fill in and check back until I finish all uh, block by block and then all my, three, all my horizon would be interpreted. So my horizon have been interpreted in the 3D vision and then my faults also interpreted in 3D vision and I, I have both of them. I have the uh, horizons and I have my fault planes together. I can go directly and put them on a structural model. Now, my horizon are okay and have been checked and their termination against my fault plane have been checked. Both of them, I can start to build my uh, structural model. But there is a question. Your data on the time domain and if you do a structural model on the time domain, you would never be able to follow up next step to calculate reserve. So you need to change all of your data. If it's not from the beginning on the depth domain, you need to change it to the, uh, 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 to the depth domain. How can I do that? Oh, I can do that with what we call it uh, a velocity model. I mean, I have to have my data, change it from the time domain to the depth domain. Uh, I'm gonna fly over the uh, velocity. I'm not going to say any details, but actually uh, uh, rule of thumb. All the velocity, actually the velocity is the most complicated topic in the seismic. That's the, the, the explorationist or the geophysicist who understand the velocity is one of the best geophysicists. I consider him the hero of the uh, uh, interpretation because actually it's, it, it had a lot, the velocity had a lot of uncertainties into our data. When we go to the reservoir engineer, it adds a lot of uncertainties. That is, we have to be aware of in order to calculate the right volume for, for, for uh, comes from the GNG. So uh, rule of sum, the velocity could be measured or calculated or estimated. It's have been uh, uh, listed like that according to the accuracy. To the measure is the most accu uh, accurate one. When you put your tool inside the well and then you measure the velocity inside the well, this is the most accurate one representing the well. Uh, 
uh, or actually, or you can get it from core, but you have to take in consideration the pressure, the temperature, the condition of the core in order to measure the velocity. Then we calculate it if you, look, if you use as example VEX equation or any other equation in order to calculate uh, uh, velocity. Then you can do some sort of estimation. So the, uh, the least one, the last one is the least uh, for the accuracy. Less accuracy and then accuracy change as you go to up. Then any names like instantaneous average interval root mean square apart, any one of those could be measured and could be calculated and could be estimated. If I have, because usually you do have many sources while you are doing your time to depth conversion. So look at the sources of uh, velocity that started with measure. If you do have measure, start with measure. If you have calculated, do calculate. If you have estimate, if you have the three, you will do a model using the three and see the different scenarios for the uncertainties. Uh, to understand the complexities, the velocity affect what? Porosity, affect density. Temperature, great size, poor pressure, overburden, frequency, many, many, the presence of gas and oil. I'll tell you what, some of the uh, small gas could give you the same indication like a very few big field saturation of gas because of the velocity. So we need to understand the velocity as well. I'm not going to also uh, to uh, uh, take more about the velocities, but I'll give you some just flyover that the model of the velocity could be a single layer. I can do layer by layer, bed by bed, or I can do all the layer together in what to call it multi-layer or layer cake, or actually the uh, yellow one, which is the most accurate recent one, where we do a 3D grid velocity model. In that velocity model, we do that. We have the seismic horizon on the time domain that covers the area. We have the stacking velocity that comes up from processing center or migration velocity, and we have the well top as a calibrations, and then we have the check shot uh, uh, velocity. We use those four uh, uh, managers together to, to build a 3D velocity uh, model grid, and this grid will produce for me a 3D velocity model that I can get my uh, uh, faults and my uh, fault planes and my horizon together into that model and got my model into the depth domain from the other thing. And usually this is a step on most of the world right now using this such kind of time to depth conversion, unless you have a pre-stack depth migration data in the depth domain, then you will work directly on the depth domain. You don't need to, this, to do these steps. Now we change our data from time to depth and our data is ready if you would like to finish your structural model. You can do it. You can do now your structure model. A question will be raised. The seismic exploration is only structure? And the answer, big no. We have stratigraphic interpretation. But never and ever start a stratigraphic interpretation without understanding the regional geology of the area and without understanding the structure model of your data. So you do your interpretation for the structure model and then finish the structure model and then go to the uh, seismic interpretation, uh, seismic stratigraphic interpretation. And also then you have what we call it uh, uh, seismic sequence stratigraphy. And then we have direct hydrocarbon ind uh, indications and uh, AVO or DHI. Uh, this will cover uh, the rest part of the lecture, which is seismic stratigraphic attribute and the seismic uh, and strate stratigraphic interpretation and using the direct hydrocarbon indicators and amplitude versus offsets. This is the represent a very important part for the exploration seismology. Actually, usually a big part of that area is now is, is called QI, quantitative interpretation. So actually this part is a quantitative interpretation, dive, dive more into quantitative interpretation. What does it mean of quantitative interpretation? It means that I can give the GNG or the geophysicists can give the, his colleague from the geologist and from the reservoir engineer idea about the uh, uh, porosity uh, of the reservoir all over the area from the seismic, about the water saturation, about the sand shale ratio, about all other uh, uh, quantitative stuff uh, uh, that they need in order to calculate their uh, uh, volumetric, their, uh, the, the volume in place of gas or of oil. So this part 
could be named as quantitative interpretation, uh, while the qualitative interpretation usually relative to the structure interpretation and a very small part from the uh, AVO only. Let me jump uh, very fast on the stratigraphic interpretation. I'm going to just list one thing, one of the attributes. We've got an attribute for the structure interpretation, and we've got only one example, which is the variance or coherence, and we have learned how we use this uh, variance or coherence in order to detect uh, the strike of our fault. In this case, I, I'm using the stratigraphic uh, attribute for the stratigraphic interpretation in order to pick up the geometry of a channel. So as example, uh, this is what we call it spectral decomposition. Very fast, what does it mean spectral decomposition? It means that I decompose the signal, the signal around my target in here into single frequency. Say I have many frequencies into my target in here, which is from five uh, 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 hertz up to 60, 70, 80 hertz. So I decompose this interval into volumes of uh, uh, different uh, uh, single frequencies. Actually, the decomposing itself will reveal the shape of the stratigraphic feature according to a principal rule that the, the, the change from sand, Anesthesia, Nigel Anesthesia started this principle almost 30 years ago, and he mentioned that the change from sand to shape or from shape to sand is very sensitive to the frequency content or vice versa. Yes, so accordingly, we started to see when we resolve and decompose our seismic uh, band into uh, uh, different uh, 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 single volumes, and then we convolve them again, or actually we blend them, and we give each single uh, uh, frequency a color. So as example, the 40 hertz, we give it blue, the green, the 50 hertz, we give it green, the 60 hertz, we give it, it, and then we blend them together, and the time slice at that level. And it, as you can see, the blending, it gives us the shape of the different channel system that goes there. This is published by British Petroleum about 20 years ago, about 18 years ago. And actually, you can extract this geo body by many different software now, and you can calculate uh, 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 your volumetric from it. So this is a kind of stratigraphic interpretation. Just to give you a flavor about the stratigraphic interpretation. Now, there is another thing concerning the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the um, uh, direct hydrocarbon indicator, which is the AVO or amplitude versus offset. Actually, uh, 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 when we acquire our data, we are using seismic, and the seismic have some uh, 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 near the source uh, receiver and away from the source receiver. The receiver that near the source should receive the, the, the most energy, so the reflection should be the reflection from the subsurface at the nearest offset should have the biggest or the strongest uh, reflection. A while from the same point, the last receiver, the far away receiver, should receive the, uh, the, the least reflection. In case of the presence of hydrocarbons, especially gas, this uh, simple uh, uh, phenomena is not there because the presence of the gas inside the sand change the elastic properties of the rock itself, and it will, be, it will, it will shape differently. As example, if you are here and you are throwing a piece of a stone on the top of the water, if you throw it this uh, more or less with angle, this uh, stone will jump and hit the water and jump and hit, and hit the water. A while, if you actually, uh, and this is, if you actually uh, uh, got this stone and you throw it up, you didn't throw it back into the water or with angle, you throw it up, it will go and then it will sink directly into the water. Why did the water behave different when you, when you throw the stone with an angle? Uh, well, when you, when, you throw, when you throw the stone, it, it, since it goes vertical. When it goes vertical, it sinks directly. When it goes with angle, it's actually hit the surface and it's have some sort of resistivity. Because actually, uh, the liquid uh, uh, according, the liquid behaves different. The, uh, uh, the, the rock behave exactly, the, the rock behave, behave exactly like uh, uh, in case of the angle. Uh, while the liquid behave differently. When you put the liquid inside the, which is uh, the fluid inside the, uh, the, the rock, it change the rock properties of the, uh, 
uh, of the rock itself and the, the, the result of what? That the far offset will give you higher amplitude. So amplitude versus offset, as the amplitude increase, the far offset, the uh, 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 amplitude, as you can see in here. So this is the near offset and this is the far offset and this interval is saturated with gas. So it's a sand saturated gas, as you can see, as you go from the near offset to the far offset, the amplitude increase, give you an indication on the presence of gas. Actually, this is a simple rule of thumb, and this rule has a lot of deviation from it. Uh, another thing I would like to, uh, to, to give your attention to, the direct hydrocarbon indicators. From the seismic, we can predict that there is an oil directly without drilling. As example, this is an anticline, and this is a nice event uh, so this is an anticline, while well, this a nice horizontal event comes from the oil water contact or the hydrocarbon uh, 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 liquid contact. So if you have gas here and oil there, or if you have oil there and water here, and this is a contact, and this contact is imaged from the seismic, so we can predict it directly. Also, what we call it bright spots and dim spots. There is on the seismic some areas where something like that is very bright, actually. It's, it's almost flat but also it's bright. So this brightness tell you that this area have something different than that area or that area, and this is what we call it bright spot, in case bright spot. So you have an area that have different, uh, uh, different uh, behavior uh, between the up and down. So here are high, high velocity, here low. Here high velocity, here low, well, here's very low. When you have something like that, this will give you a bright spot or vice versa. And also, if you have low velocity with high, low velocity with high, low with high, this will give you a dim spot. So the presence of bright spots, dim spots, or flat spots is a kind of DHI or direct hydrocarbons indicator. Last thing on, on, on our uh, talk is the seismic inversion. Actually, all, our, all what we are doing here is our interpretation on the seismic, we are interpreting the interface between layers. Because actually seismic looks for the reflection that comes from the interface between two different layers. Those two different layers have different acoustic impedance or have different density and velocity. So layer one got density one, velocity one. Layer two got density two, uh, velocity two. As much as the, the difference in velocity density or acoustic convenience, you will see reflection. So your reflection comes from the interface. It didn't come from the bed. It come from the interface between two beds. By the end of the day, you are mapping the surface as representing a top of the, but, uh, but a, while, a while it is comes from the interface. It didn't give any logical information about the, the bed itself, about what happening on the bed itself. In order to get geology, you need to change your domain from the uh, uh, domain of the uh, uh, reflection into the domain of the acoustic impedance itself. So when we change the data from uh, 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 the uh, domain of the seismic into the domain of the acoustic impedance, this means we are doing an inversion. We are switching data from seismic data directly into geological data into geological data. As example, in the front of you, the earth is comes from different geologic units. Then if I got the geologic unit and I shot seismic, I convert with them with wavelet, like I give them seismic and I responded back a seismic section. So this seismic section is the printed one. Does this part representing the geology here? No, it does represent the difference in that one is representing the difference in the acoustic in, 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 the, in, in the interface. A while, in case of inversion, I have my seismic and I'd like to change it to geology. I'd like to, to, to make it like geology in here. So this mean I do what? I have to make an acoustic and to do an acoustic change that seismic into acoustic and and this called seismic inversion. And actually, if you, somebody asked me, do we need to do a, an, an inversion, seismic inversion for every project that I'm doing with? And the answer is, if you are doing uh, regional, uh, 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 regional interpretation, maybe you don't. But if you are doing a prospect, then you must. If you are doing a development uh, field, then you must. 
So in case of development field, you must do seismic inversion. In case of the prospect field, you must do uh, also uh, an inversion because actually you need to, in case of the uh, uh, prospect, you need to calculate precisely your volumetry according to your economics, okay? In case of uh, uh, development, you already uh, uh, have a development plan and you don't need to drill uh, a dry hole within the development reach. So you need to understand exactly the distribution of porosity, the permeability, your water saturation, your every quantitative uh, single uh, uh, parameter. And this is called seismic inversion. Now the seismic inversion changing your data from the reflection of the seismic into acoustic impedance and into geology meaning could be done with a stack data, and we call it post-stack inversion, or you can do it pre-stack inversion. The main difference, in case of the pre-stack, you will be able to calculate some quantitative parameters, like water saturation, porosity, or whatever. Uh, while in case of post-stack, you will never be able to calculate any quantitative figures, but you will use more or less a qualitative uh, interpretation. So in case of inversion, this is a volume of seismic. I can change it directly. There is many, many, many algorithms to change the seismic data into acoustic impedance or inversion post stack. And you can get some understanding about porosity, uh, fluid uh, contact, some of the content uh, uh, lithology, but qualitatively, not quantitatively because it's a post stack. Then if it is pre-stack, the different things are different because actually you can get what you can get porosity lithology i would put you can get acoustic impedance or porosity and density uh, and you can prediction for fluid type it's gas it's oil water you can do whatever we call it as a uh, fluid substitution you can do many things many things using seismic inversion well this is just a flyover for all the, what the seismic data can give you the last message that I want to uh, uh, give it to my colleague here, uh, for the geologist and geophysicist, this is more or less understandable. For my reservoir engineer uh, colleagues, I would like to give their attention to the geophysicist or the geophysicist got limitation on, uh, on the tool that he's using, which is the resolution. He cannot see every bit. He cannot see every single uh, thin bit also got complexes from the subsurface from the structure. So he's got uncertainties because of the velocity that he's using, uh, the change from time to depth. He got some complexes from the structure that he's doing interpretation, structure interpretation. He got some complexes on doing stratigraphic interpretation, of course, yes. The end result is that he got a very big list of uncertainties. And these uncertainties will directly go to the, uh, uh, your model as a reservoir engineer, final model of a reservoir engineer as a static model as example, or even as a dynamic model. So the cooperation between the geologists, the geophysicists, and the reservoir engineers, uh, and the production engineer as well, should be very close. Because actually, it's not delivering uh, output. You don't deliver the GNG work to the reservoir engineer and leave it to him, no. Or to the geomodeler or the guy that said, you have to work as a team because by the end of the day, you will calculate a volume and this volume will be used for drilling, will be capitalized and will be used for the future of the company. And this will affect directly on the future of the company. So do this work with understanding the uncertainties within this work and also understand why you need to understand the example default. If you have two compartment, and you have between those two different uh, uh, compartments, you have a uh, change on the uh, pressure. And you don't have a fault uh, uh, between them. So you go back directly to your colleague and he recheck the uncertainty, uncertainty is present and maybe he can pick for you that fault that is unresolvable and add it to the model. So again and again and again. Work as a group, work as a team, and each one uh, uh, integrate the other uh, together and don't ever deliver, accept you as a surgeon, don't accept just a deliver from your geophysicist and geologist and then continue work directly blindly. No, work as a very close team. And I think I'm, I'm done. Uh, thank you. 
and looking forward now for any uh, question. Okay, uh, thanks Dr. Ali for your uh, interesting uh, presentation and actually we have learned a lot of uh, during this presentation. Uh, we will move uh, to some questions. Uh, the question number one uh, from James, it says, uh, what is the difference between metric and the gross fault? That is uh, a good question. I used to tell the guys, uh, not every uh, 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 gross fault is a listric. Uh, while uh, each listric is a gross. So when I say gross, it's a very uh, 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 regional word. I mean, the gross could start at one bid, at one age, and then finished. The gross could start within the age of the fault or the last part of the fault. So in this case, it's a gross fault by any means because it's growth on, a, uh, on a, an interval, just one interval, time interval. So the grossing of the bed happened into one time interval. And that's why it's very important. When you say gross fault, you have to complete the statement. You say gross fault on the Turonian or gross fault on the uh, 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 Maastrichtian. This describes that the grossing happened only during the Maastricht. Or you can say gross fault all over the fault. Uh, while in case of Lestric, the Lestric usually it's a gross on most of the age of the fault. And also the Lestric got this interesting feature. It's a crescent shape on the cross section and the crescent shape on the map view. So in this case, you can say it's a gross fault. Yes, it's a lestric, but it's a gross fault. But you will never to, to, to call the, uh, uh, the gross fault as a lestric only. So not every uh, gross fault is lestric, but each lestric is a gross. Okay, okay? Uh, thank you, doctor, uh, for your answer. Uh, the question number two uh, says, uh, asymmetrical anticline always indicate inversion that's very nice. Actually, when, when I say uh, uh, indication, I say criteria, not an indication. You have at least seven to nine criteria to pick from them the presence of inversion. One of them is asymmetric, but the asymmetric could happen on different other styles. As example, you have fault that, that throwing normal uh, down and then reverse up, and then asymmetric anticline, and then the presence of uh, uh, Grappen over horse or horse over grappen, and then the change of the depositional center, and then the null point. All of those are criteria. You cannot only say from the asymmetric anticline only the single criteria as the vision. No, because actually there is other uh, a fe a structure feature that shows asymmetric anticline as well. So it's a one from the criteria of identification of inversion, not the, 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 the main criteria. Okay? Okay, doctor. Thanks, doctor. Uh, the question number three, uh, what is the difference between positive and the negative inversion? That's fine. Actually, uh, uh, the term positive and negative started uh, a little bit earlier, but everyone now under understand the concept. I'll tell you what, if you started with low relief as a fault, normal fault, and this normal fault uh, started on the, on the, uh, during the tension regime, and then subjected to transpression or to, uh, to compression. Then it's, it's inverted up. I mean, what was, was low become up. This is a positive. It could be vice versa. It could be something high, and then it goes down. This is a negative inversion. So the positive inversion, it started low and ended with high. The vice versa one is called a positive inver a negative inversion. So we are not dealing with any kind of negative inversion in our case. Most of the cases and most of the publication is dealing with positive inversion, which means that something was below the, below the surface and then become above the surface. It's a positive inversion. While negative inversion, as example, imagine that you have a thrust fault that give you a very nice anticline and then uh, undergone tension and they become low. This is a kind of negative inversion. So okay. for simplicity, for simplicity, use the term of positive inversion all the time. Okay, doctor. Uh, another question, uh, why the amplitude increases with offset in case of gas reservoirs? 
Actually, this is another thing. Um, maybe the, the, what I have offered for the AVO uh, is not enough in order to understand for G and G guys, but actually the behavior of the rock when you throw the stone will behave different than when you throw the, uh, than the, uh, uh, the liquid when you throw your stone. As example, if in case of the, uh, you change this, uh, uh, the water, when you have the stone, and then you throw the stone on the top of the water or with angle, it will go and hit the water and, uh, and then jump and hit the water and then jump. Now, if you change it, the water with rubber, yes, rubber, Imagine that it changed the water with rubber and you throw the stone, it will never do what it, it used to do when it was uh, liquid. This is why, because the behavior of the rubber, rubber is elastic. It behaves like rocks. And while the water is fluid, it behaves like fluid. When you put the fluid inside the rubber, so things are changing with the rubber. It has sort of mix. Rather than showing inc uh, increase on the near offset, it's showing increase on the far offset. So what change? It's not the wave. The change is the media itself, the behavior of the elastic properties of the media. When the media is fluid, it behaves a certain behavior. When the media is rock, it behaves like elastic, like rubber. When you mix the fluid and put them inside the rock, the rock behaves different. And that's why it's increased by distance. By the way, within the AVO, there is what we call it classes. It's not only increasing. There is another class that it decreases by offset and the, and the gas is there. Then another class, it's increased and then it's decreased and then increased. Uh, so you have class one, class two, and class three, and actually is there a class four and there is class five now. So you have from class one to class five different behavior for the, for, uh, for the presence of the gas, but all of them, under the impression of the change of the rock properties of the sand because of the presence of different type of fluids. Fluid include gas, or fluid includes uh, uh, water, or fluid includes salt water, or whatever the fluid is. Okay? Okay, uh, thanks, Doctor, for your uh, great uh, illustrations. It looks like we have covered most of the important questions. Uh, Dr. Ali, is there is anything else you, you wanted to cover before a rubber? Uh, actually, for me, no. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I wish that uh, my colleague captured most of uh, what we have said. And I know there is a lot of uh, many things that I just uh, flied over. Uh, but I kept in myself, myself that uh, one, one hour or two hour listening is enough. I always believe that uh, a short message is much, much better than uh, longer time. Thank you very much again for you and for your colleague. Okay, uh, thanks, Doctor, and we uh, and we appreciate that you have finished in the specified time. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, thanks, everyone, and we hope uh, to see you in our uh, next uh, lectures, inshallah. Thanks, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you.